church. We are really excited to see you today. And can you hear me? Okay. I can't hear me, so I want to make sure you can. Welcome Morris Gleiser right here on the front row, fighting cancer all year long. Wow. I'm so glad that you're here. And let's stand together. Welcome, friends. Let's lift our voice and worship Jesus. Hey, we're going to sing a beautiful hymn this morning. If you're using that red book, it's song number 587 in your hymnal. Sing this with us. I heard an old, old story. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power. See this morning.
Good morning and welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We are so glad you're here today. If you will, go ahead and take out the bulletins you should have received on the way in. Inside of there is a little card that says connection card on it. And uh, we just want to ask if we can pray for you this week in some way. Take a moment and share a prayer request with us on this card. If you're a guest here today, you're our honored guest. We are really glad uh, you joined us this morning. And we'd ask, if you would, to share with us how you heard about Emmanuel. Uh, you can mark that on there in your prayer requests and marking those. In just a few moments, the ushers are going to come by to receive an offering, and you could drop those cards in the plate. If you're a guest here today, uh, we have a gift for you. And so on your way out today, you'll see these next step tables in the back. There will be some friendly people standing there. If you'll just stop by and say, hey, I'm visiting today, they want to put a gift in your hand that includes a book our pastor wrote called Done, What Most Religions Don't Tell You About the Bible. This has been a, lot, a big help to a lot of people as it takes the message of the Bible and kind of simplifies it to a, an easy-to-read uh, book here. And so we would like to put that in your hands. Stop by on your way out this morning. Thank you so much for being here. At this time, though, we want to ask everyone to stand. And greet someone around you. Say good morning while the music plays. Church family, go ahead and find your seat this morning. We're going to sing a beautiful song, It Is Well With My Soul. It's an old hymn combined with a new chorus, and I hope that you'll sing this strong with us this morning. When peace like a river. When peace like a
great song this morning. Hope that you can make that your heart's cry throughout this week. It is well, oh my soul. We're gonna continue singing one more song this morning called Only a Holy God. We've been learning this. Sing this with us if you know this. Wow, you sound beautiful this morning, and, uh, and uh, we are so thankful that a holy God, a great, powerful, perfect God, condescended and came to us and loves us and accepts us as we are. I want the ushers to prepare for the offering. I want to thank you for being faithful in giving. I want you to pray that we can recover from January. Uh, because we missed a Sunday, and, uh, and so you pray that God would help us to see that recovered in February. How many of you are saying, I need to recover from January anyway? I, I, okay. All right. I want to ask you to go ahead and be seated for a second, and I want to share with you a little bit about my week. And part of why I want to share it with you is because I want you to be aware 
of what God is doing with, uh, with some, in some small ways with our investment as a church into gospel ministry. There's always more happening than we could possibly share with you on a Sunday morning, especially if we're going to worship and learn and grow in God's Word, and those are the priorities. But I want to take just a few minutes and tell you about, actually, three or four years ago, I received an invitation to go to Honduras uh, for a a retreat in, in uh, the end of January for missionary couples, for missionary families. And I said no uh, to this invitation two or three years in a row. And, uh, and then about a year ago, God finally gave me a, a peace in my heart and spirit to accept this invitation as really our whole church, I want us to continue as the next decade and two, I want us to just get more and more engaged in missions and getting the gospel around the world. And I've been praying uh, that God would not just partner us, you know, on a small monthly amount with a lot of missionaries. I think we have 50 or 55 missionaries and churches that we're planting, and, and, uh, and, and you're so faithful to give, which is helping us to create a budget of how to steward those gifts and, and, and to make sure that they're going into church planting and gospel preaching and life-changing ministries. But I've been asking God the last few years to really show us as a church and, and connect me with some ministries that we could strategically, in a big way, in a bigger way, in the coming years, partner with. And I really believe that God led me uh, to one of, two of those ministries this week, and I want to tell you about them. You'll meet both of these men later this year. Uh, but I got on a plane Wednesday morning, went down to, uh, flew down to Honduras, which is actually uh, fairly easy to get to. It's a third world country, just just right outside of our border. It's really amazing that a couple hours outside of Atlanta, you land in a, in a country that just feels like another planet in terms of its development and level of poverty and, and destitution and need. Um, and I, I met two missionaries when I, when I hit the ground, if you can put those photos up, fellas. On the left is Matt Goins. On the right is Bradley Edmondson, two of the finest men I've ever known. Matt has been in Honduras now for 12 years, and it's his work where I was visiting. He was hosting a retreat for missionaries in Central America. And so for three days, I got to speak to those missionaries, to a group of those missionaries, about 60 of them, and just try to encourage them and tell them we're praying for them, we love them, and encourage their families as well. Matt's got a wonderful family, uh, three teenage uh, children growing up on the mission field. And I mean, his kids were just pounding me with questions, theological questions, life questions, college questions. I mean, every waking moment of the day I was talking to or counseling or advising or encouraging somebody, and his kids were a lot of fun. On the right is Bradley Edmondson. Bradley leads a ministry. You can look it up later, not now if you don't mind, but it's, a, it's called Medical Missions Outreach. And Bradley uh, basically coalesces materials, resources, equipment, and then professionals. Everybody from, from nurses to, to, to surgeons. And he teams them up and he takes them all over the world. They will do 13 medical missions trips to third world countries this year. He's building surgery centers in four or five different countries. Um, he has uh, major, major uh, efforts going on to provide medical uh, support and help to these people, these impoverished people in third world countries. But here's what he does, and I love this, I love the combination of this. He partners with churches. And so what he's done here in, in Matt's property is he has partnered with Matt's church there in El Progreso, Honduras, uh, which is just outside of a large city, San Pedro Sula, and um, they conduct periodic clinics where thousands, really hundreds maybe, I'm not sure the numbers uh, in that particular clinic, but anybody that needs medical treatment from, from eye exams to, to amputations, I mean, they come into this clinic and they're treated for free over two weeks, but they're at the site of a church, and so they're given the gospel while they're at this church, and then the church continues to follow up on those that receive the treatment. And it is, it is an amazing, an amazing experience. Go ahead and scroll through the photos if you would, and I'll just talk about, so that's the site of the church. And it's, it was amazing. I had no idea what to expect. We're driving through literally just, just total poverty. We turn a corner down a dirt road. We came around a palm tree, and there was that beautiful property that God is developing. Uh, and that's the, the church building and a thriving church there in this third world country. Got to preach there Wednesday night. If you can go to the next slide, I think that's the Wednesday night service. Uh, so that's the inside of the church building. Tremendous spirit, much like Emmanuel, just uh, incredible spirit of, of gospel-centric praise, worship, uh, uh, and fellowship together. It was wonderful. Next slide. 
So this is their children's home. Two buildings uh, where they house and raise up orphans um, and, uh, and, and families that are placed in uh, high-risk type situations. And there's children growing up in there. So the first thing we did, we pulled onto this property, got out of the car, and Matt said, we're going to go in and have lunch. Or actually, I guess it was dinner. We're going to have dinner with the kids. So the next picture, I walked into this group of teenagers, and as soon as I walked into the room, that little girl in the middle with the book, you can see she's holding a done book. And it says H-O, that, that's Spanish for done. And from across the room, she held that book up, and she said, did you write this? And I said, how, did you, how do you speak English? <laughs> you know? and, and, the, and Matt looked at me and said, a lot of these kids speak English because our house parents are teaching them as they're growing. And she held that book. She said, did you write this? I said, I sure did. She said, oh, I want you to sign it. So they all gathered around, and I, and I wrote a note to her in that book, and I said, guys, I got to take a picture of this, you know. And so we turned around and got a picture, and uh, that was a lot of fun. It was just, it was an awesome, wonderful moment of just seeing how God has used our church to touch people I would have never otherwise met. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, so there's the smaller children, and we're getting ready to have fish for dinner, fish and rice. We had a good time. Those kids were a blast. They sat there with me and talked to me and uh, asked me questions, and it was a lot of fun. Oh, that little girl in the pink shirt, she said, you sit with me? I said, oh, sure, I'll sit with you. So anyway, let's go to the next one. Um, so that was the missionaries, and we were just having our morning sessions there. Um, a great group of folks from all over Honduras and some from outside of the country, El Salvador and maybe others. Next slide. That is, now this is amazing, okay, that's a building, that's a third, no, that's a fourth building on the property behind the church, and that's Bradley and Matt. That's an 8,000 square foot surgery center. It is still under construction. The exterior is, they're actually uh, moving in furniture and gear right now. You can go to the next slide. This is just a shot of the hallway, but you can see in the hallway supplies, uh, surgical tables. I mean, I, I, I could take another 30 minutes and show you the pictures of all the rooms, two fully equipped operation surgical rooms, uh, recovery room, uh, upstairs apartments and rooms where the doctors and surgeons will stay while they're on site. Um, and he's doing that. That's the first one that's being completed. That, that building in the States would cost millions of dollars. They're constructing that building in Honduras, totally constructing, furnishing, supplying it, laparoscopic surgery, I mean, you name it, big, big, big gear, $500,000 all of it. And you know what you can get a CT scan done for in Africa? About $30. Isn't that crazy? Um, so the, it, what they're doing is, is really powerful, how they're teaming up the medical component with the local church component. Again, you'll meet Bradley later this year. If you are a medical professional or have experience, uh, he would love to get you on his trips and team you up. And the, the ministry is just exploding. They're based in Baltimore, but they're doing amazing work. Next, next picture. And I'll, 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 I'll wrap this up here. Brent, we weren't supposed to show them that one. I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. Yeah, yeah you notice it's cloudy there. They knew I was coming, so they brought the clouds out. No, I got, I got up in 20-degree weather at 3.30 a.m. on Wednesday, and um, I had... I had long johns and, and sweater and, and, you know, I mean, I'm layered, layered, and I get off the plane in this third world country and it's oh, mosquitoes and heat, you know. <laughs> so I start taking stuff off. I'm like, ah, you know. Uh, it was good to see the sun and uh, <laughs> it's still shining. I just wanted to come back and tell you it's okay. Don't panic. Um, and mainly I wanted to show you this picture because I, Summer told me while I was there, it's coming back, okay? So isn't that a little bit therapeutic? Come on, come on. No, just think about it. Just feel it for a moment. Just, 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 okay. All right, next slide. Next slide. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to close with this thought. If you ever go to Honduras, that's your best friend. I'm sitting at dinner the first night. The doors of the church are open. We're sitting there, and everybody's talking, and nobody's getting eaten. But me. And I mean, like, every, I'm, I'm itching everywhere, and nobody else is itching. So I'm thinking, is this psycho, you know, am I, am I imagining this? 
So night two, I come in there and I go, I, I started getting eaten alive again and nobody's getting eaten. And I turned to somebody and I said, does anybody have bug spray? And the guy said, oh, I've got bug spray. And then somebody next to me said, oh, we didn't think about that. They like the new people. <laughs> if you've been in Honduras, you don't get eaten by mosquitoes, but new blood, they know. And I can tell you right now, to Honduran mosquitoes, I'm delicious, okay? I mean, it was, it was amazing how much I got eaten while we were there. Is that the last picture? I think it is. So we had, anyway, it was amazing three days. We will be taking groups down to this particular work like we did Mexico City, like we did Guatemala. And so if you, if you would ever, ever have an interest, I would hope you would, and I'd love to see you in the next few years get on a mission field. Uh, we'll be doing, going regularly to Mexico City, regularly to Guatemala, regularly to this work in Honduras. It would be very worth your time. It's a, it's a life-changing experience. And, and if nothing else, I just want you to know that the dollars that we give to missions um, are going not to a clearinghouse that are you know, taking, scraping off 20, top 25% for their administrative costs. The dollars we're giving to missions are going straight to places like that. And I told both those missionaries, we're working on our budget right now, but I said, you're both gonna be added to our mission support immediately. And they're both gonna be here in October to, to meet you. But I, I, I said to Matt when I got, all, when I finally got, walking around the property and seeing his work, I said, I know why you, got, why you brought me here. He said, smiled, he said, why? I said, how could I come here and not want our church to be a part of this? You know, it's like finding a stock that's going to take off. You know, you just, you just have to invest in it. And so thank you for, for giving and for investing, not just here locally, uh, but so that we can continue reaching around the world. We're gonna do some pastor training down there, uh, Josue and I and some others, and we're putting together that meeting uh, real soon, but I just look forward to, to seeing how God will develop the relationship. So thank you for praying for us. I'm going to introduce our speaker. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to hear one more song, I think, and then, uh, and then we're going to hear from God's Word. Morris Gleiser is one of my great friends and mentors. He's like a great, great grandfather to me. <laughs> I've been waiting a year to say that, especially today, you know, today of all days. So, um, uh, we, we have heard from him every year. Uh, I think this is now seven years in a row. Um, but what's unique about this past year is when he was here a year ago, he was having pain and health struggle. And right after he was here, he went to the doctor and was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, that led to a full year. I think the first time you preached was a week ago. Um, he was supposed to be here two weeks ago. We got snowed out. And uh, so... A, a full year of, of, of more struggle than I know that I could comprehend, okay? Uh, but chemotherapy and lots of other treatments and tests and then uh, stem cell, was it stem cell or bone marrow? Stem cell, bone marrow. Both, transplant. transplant. And if you're aware of that procedure, that is a very difficult procedure to go through months long uh, and, and they bring you to the brink of death in terms of your immune system and then they, they, they regrow a new, a new blood supply, basically. And so this is a man that has been through the valley of the shadow of death in the last year. And Brother Gleiser, I just want to say we prayed for you. We love you. We are so glad to see you here. And whether... <laughs> whether you have the energy to preach 10 minutes or 45 or 50 minutes, you have our attention. Church, I hope you'll come back tonight at five. I, I, someone told me there's a little game playing tonight. <laughs> I like to watch the Super Bowl as much as anybody does. We'll have a short service at five o'clock. We'll I think we'll get you out in time, plenty of time to see the game. Uh, but set your DVR if not, or whatever you do, you know. Or sit in the back and live stream it, you know. No. <laughs> he recorded three revival messages on video yesterday. And because he's physically limited, we won't, will not have Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night revival services. We'll still have Wednesday night groups, but we'll email and, and post those three messages to you tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday. And whether it's sometime during the day or the evening, I, I simply want to encourage you to have an at-home revival with your family. Sit down and hear this. And each of them are about 20 to 25 minutes, so they're not long. But I know that what he shares in those, built on today, will encourage you. So, so we're looking forward to hearing your message. Thank you for coming, Brother Gleiser. 
And uh, he probably won't be able to shake hands after service. I told him if whatever he needs to do, if he just needs to go sit down. So let's just, just be sensitive to that. But let's listen and, uh, and, and let God shape us today. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege to give as a part of our worship. God, I pray that we would give not just faithfully, but lovingly and cheerfully. Pray that our giving would be the overflow of our love for you and for what you've done for us, that we would love you because you first loved us. God, I pray today that the gospel would be clear. I pray that the message would speak and encourage each of our hearts, that we would be attuned to what you want to teach us and how you want to change and grow us. Bless our service today, tonight, and throughout the week as we hear the videos, see the videos. And God, take this offering now and and use it to, to meet the needs of our local ministry, but then ministries like Matt's and Bradley's and around the world, the works that we're investing into, continue to change lives in those places. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. The song you're about to hear is called Anthem. And uh, what I'm hoping, what I'm for being a part of the Emmanuel Baptist Church live stream today. And to those of you that are not able to be a part of a church for a variety of reasons, Thank you for letting Emmanuel be your church to come to you wherever you may be in your home or in a hospital room or wherever this broadcast finds you. I especially want to thank those of you who have reached out to me and you've said, Carrie, we have joined in the work of Emmanuel from a distance. We're giving and investing into the work of the gospel through Emmanuel Baptist Church to New England and around the world. Thank you for giving and for investing and sharing in the vision with us. If you'd like to be a part of the vision, of sharing the gospel to New England and around the world through our media ministry and through our missions, you can visit us online at ebcnewington.com forward slash give. Again, that's ebcnewington.com forward slash give. And from our hearts, thank you in advance for partnering with us. I 
I wish I could uh, wrap my arms around every wall here and just kind of hold you all in my arms for a moment and just say how much I love you and how overwhelmed and overjoyed I am to be back here with you. I'm overjoyed to be anywhere. <laughs> but I'm thrilled to be here with you. I've had a year to prepare for this. So I hope you're ready to sit for a while and uh, <laughs> had a lot of time to read and prepare and study. Thank you for all the prayers and thank you for all of the concern and thank you for all of your love. It has been <clears throat> an eventful year that I don't need to get into, but I can t say to you with all of my heart that it has been a journey that it's not over. I'm not at 100%, but I heard about, I don't know, 10, 12 days ago, the doctor said, well, you're in remission. And uh, <clears throat> so <laughs> doctors can be so sober and serious, and, and it was almost like he was disappointed. Uh, and he said, well, you're, you're in remission. I wanted to grab him and say, this is good news, you know. <laughs> and he began to tell me about some things that needed to still slightly improve, which is just very slight, but just a little bit. And when he turned to walk out, the nurse looked at us and said, yeah. I thought, thank the Lord for nurses that are common, <laughs> sensible people. Um, I would never want to go through again what we've gone through this last year, but I would never want to do without what the Lord has done for me. This last year I have regained, I was trying to tell Pastor Derek the other night, a higher view of God and of the Scriptures. The hours that I've been privileged to spend with the Lord this last year has been enormous and uh, eagerly looking forward every time I'd wake up to go spend more time with him, go with, on walks with him and just read things that would improve my knowledge of him. Well, you didn't come this morning to hear all that. I just wanted you to know that I love you 
And if I continue to talk about it, I'm going to need that whole box of Kleenexes up here with me. And so I just, I've enjoyed worshiping our Lord with you today. He's the center of our focus. And if there's been a passage that Lynn and I have wrapped our hearts around and our spiritual arms around, it's a passage that I want you to go with me this morning, and that's the passage of Philippians chapter 1. Early on in our journey, the Lord took me to this particular passage that I want us to look at together today for a few moments. And I do hope that you'll come back tonight, and Lord willing, I'll have the ability to to speak again briefly. And uh, I, I, with you, would want this service to be a brief service tonight. And if you don't normally come on Sunday night, uh, I hope that you'll try your best to be back at five for that. And uh, But for a few moments here this morning, I want to share with you some things that the Lord has given me. And I really want to pick it up beginning in verse 12, but I've got to start with verse 1 because as I was just meditating over this in the last couple of days, I, I'm not the Apostle Paul. None of us could ever be. And you're not the church at Philippi, but there's some connection here. There's some correlation between us that I I just feel like I need to read to express. His expression of love for this church in Philippi is all over. It's just all over these words. You know, you just couldn't you just couldn't discourage Paul. They said, Paul, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna beat you up. And he said, Great, I get to participate in the sufferings of Christ. That's good. They said, we're going to throw you in prison. Well, oh, good, good. That way I can give the gospel to people who are in the, 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 the confines of Caesar's household. Good, good. Tie me down now to some guards that I can get the gospel to. We're going to kill you. Oh, good. To die is gain. I mean, you just couldn't stop this guy. And it comes out in this very first chapter. Look at verse 1. He says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, forgive me. If you can physically join me, would you stand with me while we read through this this morning? The servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet or fitting and proper for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart Inasmuch as both in my bonds and and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels, that is the affections of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Now, notice carefully, beginning in verse 12, this verse has just gripped me this year. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice. Yea, and I will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer, And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life 
or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Father, help me in the moments that we have together to represent you right. Now, Lord, Paul was saying he wanted to magnify Christ. And Lord, Lord Jesus, you are the one to be magnified today. So help me not to get in the way of what needs to be stated today. May our time together be a time in which you are exalted and God's people are strengthened and anyone who does not know you will be drawn to you today. Spirit of God, do your masterful work, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. You know, it's incredible to me how, you know this is true, that all of us know what it is to use the word need. We always talk about things that we need. Oh, I just need something. And we really probably don't, but we talk like we do. You know, we say, oh, I just, I, uh, I, I, I need, uh, I, I'm so thirsty, someone says. I just, I need a, a, a Coke or a Dr. Pepper would be better. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I need such and such, you know. Uh, ladies, come on, give me a break. I mean, you know what it is. Uh, you, you say, oh, I, I need those shoes. I mean, I, mean, I have need them. I found six inches in my closet where I can squeeze another pair of shoes there. And, of course, when I get those shoes, I'll, of course, need to, get a new purse to go with it and, uh, and maybe a whole new outfit to, to, to go with it and maybe, maybe a new, uh, I don't know, new manicure and, and, and uh, maybe a new house. I, I mean, I just, I need those shoes. And for every husband who just poked his, his wife, you know what you've said, oh, I need a new truck. You know, I need, I mean, I mean my other one is, is dirty. I need a new car, you know. I need a new set of wheels. And we always talk about those things, you know. I mean, I, you know, I, I know where I'm at. Up here in New England, it's, it's Dunkin' Donut country up here. You know something? Two years ago, Lynn and I moved back to where I grew up in the state of Texas and uh, in the Dallas area. And uh, I never knew this as a kid growing up. We, we've, got, we've got a little, occasionally you can find a Dunkin' Donuts. But there are these mom and pop donut bakeries, I'm telling you folks, on every corner. They're everywhere. I never knew that. I mean, they're just everywhere. And I tell Lynn all the time, I need a donut. I mean, I really need a donut. There's one place called, I love this one, Donut Land. Now, I mean, it's like I've died and gone to Donut Land. I mean, I mean, what better place to, to be named than Donut Land? I mean, you know what it is to say, I need something. Well, when you, when you read through this, first chapter with, with Paul in this letter to the church at Philippi, you know this, it's a letter that's talking about rejoicing and, and having joy to life. And he says, I've learned to just have joy. And he says, I'm going to tell you what I've really learned. This is really all I need. I just need Christ. And that's not preacher talk. That's not just something that someone says at some stage in their life. He says, I have come to the point where I've discovered that he's all I need. And I want to tell you something, you never learn that he's all that you need until he's all that you've got. And Paul is in the place in his life where he is saying, okay, I'm in prison, but i got Christ here with me. And if I get out, and Paul kind of hints later on in this chapter, he thinks, I'm going to get out because I'm going to come and benefit you folks there in Philippi. I think I'm going to, I'm going to come back and be with you. But he says, you know, really, I, I, I just as soon go ahead and go to heaven. To die is gain. You know, he's one of those unique individuals who's saying, you know, I'd rather die, but I'm willing to live. Most of us would say, you know, I, I want to live, but, you know, if I have to, I'm willing to go ahead and die. This man is ready to die. Why? Because of Christ. And he says, what's happened unto me? Did you see that in verse 12? The things that have happened unto me. And everybody in this room could talk about the things that have happened to you, whatever it is. It was the first week of February, just like we are now. One year ago, I left here after having had some tests taken before I came here a year ago. 
And there were some questions that they saw on some MRIs and so forth. And when I went back after two biopsies, the doctor said to me, you have multiple myeloma. I had never heard that term in my life. Never heard those words, multiple myeloma. And when he caught his breath, I said, doctor, is that cancer? And he nodded, yes. I, it, it blew me out of the water. We, we didn't have the cancer in our family. There's no history. There's no, it just, where did this come from? I dropped my head and he said, he said, now don't get discouraged. We're going to fight this thing. And I said, I just need a moment to catch my breath. I, I, I just didn't know. That's what we were dealing with. I said, how long is this going to last? <laughs> I said, can you just kind of cut it out? Because I, I, I got I to gotta get back on the road. He said, this is going to take several months. I said, okay. And then I found this in Philippians 1. In the midst of your storms, in the midst of your conversations, in the midst of your disturbances, in the midst of your divorce court, doctor reports, relationship problems, children issues, when, when life happens to you, where will you, where will you find your strength? For most of you, many of you, you'll do the right thing. You know this is true. Some people take their life. They say, I can't handle this. I just can't handle it. And they take their life. That's an extreme. So for some people, they become angry. They become violent and intolerant of other people. Some people become a recluse. They don't see anybody. They don't want to talk to anybody. They just stare off in the distance and they question God and they, they get angry. But Paul declares that the real reason for these issues that have come into his life is for the furtherance of the gospel. i got to be honest with you. I don't even know all that that's going to include in my own life personally yet. But I'm ready to learn it. And I'm, I'm eager to find out more. And I pray that the same would be true of anyone here who knows the Lord and knows the gospel and could focus on it. But I want you to just to really notice verse 21. Because Paul gets it. And he wants us to get it when he says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. All I need is Jesus. Would you notice he makes a personal decision? Look at verse 21. For to me, to me, Paul was saying, I don't know what anybody else is going to do. I, this, is not, this is not something I've been pushed into. This is not something that my parents have forced upon me. This is not something that a pastor, a preacher has said, you'll, you'll be better off if you go this way. This is not something I'm doing for a business transaction to get to know people at a local assembly of church people. This is not something that I'm doing because, uh, you know, I want to keep a good social status in my family name. This is not something I'm doing because I want to keep peace in my home and keep my, keep my wife happy or to make sure my kids grow up in a good, healthy environment. No, he says, I have made a personal decision. It's Christ. For to me, I don't know what anybody else is going to do. I don't know what anybody else in my family is going to do. I don't know anybody in my school what they're going to do. I don't know anybody at my place of business what they're going to do. If I am mocked, if I am ridiculed, if I am criticized, if I am ignored, if I am treated rudely, I don't care. For to me, he makes a personal decision. Can I just, can I just bring this down to the, to the level of everybody to understand something here? Look, friends, no one can make you come to accept Christ as your personal Savior. It's an individual, personal decision. And if I could make the decision for you, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Because the greatest decision I have personally ever made is to accept Christ. To understand as we heard sung and, 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 and were, were blessed with today, the Lord wants to adopt you into his family. And he's made it possible for you to be brought into fellowship with him. 
And when I say I want to, the great decision was when I accepted Christ, the truth is he accepted me. What a miracle that is. And there may be someone here this morning, the truth is you've never come to know Christ. Your eternal destiny is determined by what you do with Jesus Christ. I mean, if we went out today and stopped people on the street, we'd say, what are you doing outside in this cold weather? But then, then, then if we said, we said to them, are you on your way to heaven? Do you know that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? They'd look at you and they'd probably say something like, mm, I think so. Yeah, I hope so. Um, probably. Uh, I, I'm not totally sure, but I think I'm going to go to heaven when I die. You know why people say that? And there may be someone in this room who says those sort of things. It's because you think that it's all based upon what you do. I, yeah, I think I'm going to go to heaven. I think I'm going to be all right. But, uh, you know, I, I do need to clean up a couple of areas in my life. And there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's some language issues in my life I need to take care of. And there's some... Uh, there's some um, Ah, oh, there's some things that, I, boy, I just need to stop doing and so forth. I've got some pretty bad habits. But, you know, I know some people that are a lot worse off than I am. So I really think I'm going to be all right. Look, friends, it has nothing to do with what you do to get to God. Because here's something I say all the time. You can't get you to God. You can't do it. It's not based upon what you do. The fact is, the only way you get to God is to admit that you can't get to God on your own. You need what is called a savior, a rescuer. You need someone who's going to take you to glory. I sat down with a girl. She was 21. She came from an extremely terrible home, just an extremely bad home. Her dad was a drunk and mistreated her, and her mom was a very, very hateful mom. Don't have time to give you the details. It's an extremely bad situation. She she had a grandmother who wanted to have nothing to do with this, this girl. I mean, everybody around her disliked her and hated her, and so she was filled with hate herself. And I sat down and told her about the greatest love she could ever know, and that's the love of God, that he gave someone for her to take her place, to pay for her sin. And after about an hour explaining to her what Jesus Christ had done for her, she looked at me and she says, you, you mean he loves me? I said, absolutely. Oh, she said, then I want him. I said, you can have him. Have you come to that point where you recognize you need the Savior? It may be that you sit here this morning and you know all the language about Jesus, but you've never come to Jesus. You know the songs about Jesus, but you've never accepted Jesus. Here's Paul. He's saying, I've made a decision. It's Christ. For to me... To live is Christ. To me, it's a personal decision. For sake of time, let me move on to something else very quickly. Would you notice also a pointed direction? I mean like a laser, like a laser going to its, to its target. Notice what he says, for to me to live is Christ. Now, I'm not trying to be overly technical. I'm not smart enough to be, but I want you to know that in the original manuscripts, the word is there is not in the original manuscript. In other words, for emphasis, here's really what Paul was saying. For to me to live, Christ. That's what he's saying. And he goes on to say, and to die, <laughs> gain. The word is is a great word for us. The translators give it to us to help us to understand it, to speak grammatically the way we all speak. But here's what Paul was saying. He's saying, for me to live, Christ. Everything is wrapped up in Christ. Paul's best friend. Paul's most intimate friend. Paul's central focus. Paul's secret to real joy was Jesus Christ. For some of us in this room, it might be that you'd have to say, for me to live is Money, and to die is to leave it all behind. For me to live is possessions, everything that that money can buy, the things that I enjoy getting, stuff. For me to live is this stuff, and to die is to leave it to my family, and they'll, they'll sell it all off. For me to live is power authority over other people and to die is to be forgotten and someone to take your place 
For me to live is beauty, attractiveness, and to die is to be decayed. For me to live is my family, somebody says. Nothing wrong with that, to enjoy your family, but to live for only their family and to die is to, again, leave them behind and you're nothing but a photograph and a memory. No, there's nothing wrong with having some things. There's nothing wrong with having some nice uh, things in your life. There's nothing wrong with advancing and having authority at your place of business. There's nothing wrong with having a sweet family gathered around you. Nothing wrong with any of that. The problem is not having those things. The problem is when those things have you. And they consume your life. And then they're the focus of your life. And Jesus is nothing more but an add-on. Paul is saying, for me to live, I'm telling you, it's wrapped up in one person. And it's Jesus Christ and in him alone. May I simply say to every child of God in this building today, It is one thing to say, I love the Lord Jesus. I love him with all my heart. I love love to sing his songs. I love to rejoice and and worship him. But when honestly, the sole central focus of your life is Jesus Christ, until you get to that point, you're really not living. Paul is saying, here's what I've discovered. The real direction of my life is wrapped up in being with Christ and only him. I can tell you for the fact of the matter is, For hours, I had the joy and privilege of just getting up in the morning, sometimes getting up super early. In fact, I loved to get up early. I loved it so that I could have more time with my God. You say, why? Because, friends, I'm going to tell you, I had no place to go. Unless it was a doctor's appointment, I had no place to go. There was no clock that I was watching like right now. I mean, I'm thinking, get that clock out of my sight back there, would you? (laughs) I never had to look at the watch and say, when's the next time I got to go somewhere? I got to meet a pastor. I got to go preach. I got to do this. I got. It was just me and my books and my Bible and my God. And when I was able to walk, I would say to Lynn, I'd say, Lynn, I'm, I'm going for a walk. And she knew what that meant. I'd be gone for quite some time. Neighborhood we lived in, I would just walk around. I loved I loved it. I love to just walk and talk to the Lord about the beauty of his creative hand. He became a central focus. No, he became the central focus of my life. And any book that I read was for the purpose of knowing him better. Come on, man, you've you've had central focuses of your life before. You know what I'm talking about. When I was in college uh, a long time ago, when I was in college... I, would, I, had a, I had a job on Saturday. It was really a, a, really a, a high-ranking, uh, really a big job. It was a very important job. It was, I worked at a grocery store. And uh, I stocked shelves and sacked groceries. And it was just for extra cash that I needed while I was in college to help pay for things. And, and while I, I was working at this, at this uh, uh, on a hot Saturday at this grocery store, I'd work for at least 10 hours and sometimes even more and just just be all hot and sweaty by the end of the day and and by the time I'd check out and get clocked out I'd go back to my college and and I'd go to my room and normal people would just kind of uh, maybe shower and fall into bed but I would I would clean up change clothes grab my books and and and, and grab everything that I needed to, to study and I'd make my way to the college library you say wow you were really studious. Oh, no, no, no. You really want to make good grades. Well, yeah. You say, well, what, what took you there? <laughs> Lynn. That's what it took me to the library. <laughs> Lynn was there. And she sat at one desk over there and studied, and I sat at my desk and looked at her, you know. <laughs> that was my focus. And occasionally look back down and say, all right, where am I? Oh, I need to turn the book back around the normal way here. I found the energy to be with her, to focus on her because, come on, man, it was young love and it was ready to be blossomed into a future marriage. May I simply say to anyone who knows Christ as Savior, I have to ask you, have, has, have there been so many distractions in your life? Have there been so many disturbances? Have there been so many disappointments and discouragements? Has there been a lot of disobedience in your life that has caused you to just kind of, you know, 
take your, take your eyes off of the Lord. To, he's not the central focus anymore. As I said, for some of you, it may be some disobedience in your life, some sin that you just clear-cut boldly or disobeying the Lord. But for a lot of you in this room, it just could be just distractions, raising the kids and, 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 and having hobbies and, and, and running your business and going and going and going and going. I got to meditate in this last year. I never see the Lord Jesus in a frantic mode when you read his life. He's never saying, "Come, no, oh, man, just oh, how am I going to get everything done?" He got everything done every day he was supposed to do. Now he was sometimes at a fast pace, like when he was going to Jerusalem. But you never see Jesus all tied up in knots, trying to figure out how he's going to do everything. Why? Because when he got to the end of his life, he said, "I have finished the work you have given me to do. For me to live is, is Christ. My focus is on Him." My focus is to, to know him. You read of Moses in Exodus 33 where he simply said, God, show me your glory. I want to know you. David, when you read through the Psalms, and there's, I've read the Psalms every day for a year. David said, I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord. And many times he would say, seek the Lord. He was telling others, make sure you go after him, pursue him. And right here in the book of Philippians, Paul said, let me tell you what my goal of life is. That I may know him. He'd been, he'd been converted for over 30 years by this time. He was not some new Christian. He was saying, I've known the Lord. I've walked with the Lord. But let me tell you what my goal is. There's more about him I need to know. For me to live is Christ. He's the focus of my life. This church in Philippi was receiving a letter telling them to rejoice, to rejoice. Most of you, you've studied this book, you've read it, you've studied it in some adult Bible study, maybe in church you went gone through a study of the book of Philippians. You know that's the overriding theme, to joy, to rejoice in the Lord. If you, if you ask people, in this area. Hey, what do you think of when you think about Christians? What do you think of when you think about people who go to church? And of course, you know, when you ask that of people, they're going to think about people who go to all kinds of churches. I can say this about your church, that you would fall in a good category in this area, but you know this is true, and only you can answer for yourself. If someone asks, hey, what do you think, what do you think of about church-going people? Would they say, well, let me tell you something about some people I know that go to church. I'm going to tell you something. i tell you, they love life. They are enjoying life. And i tell you, I need more of what they got. I mean, they just, they, they just have, a, they have a joy and a countenance. Or would they say, ah, uh, they argue a lot. Uh, those church-going people, they, uh, they're pretty, you know, kind of petty. Uh, kind of critical, especially about other people who don't do it the way they do it. No, I just tell you what, I, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're anxious. I mean, I work with this guy at work, and I mean, he's just always tied up in knots. I think I saw him smile the other day when he was leaving work, and that's about the only time I've ever seen him smile. Most of the time, he's all tied up in knots, and he's all disgusted and disgruntled, and he's full of anxiety. You know something, I don't really need what those Christians have got because they don't have, I've got enough worry of my own. May I ask you something, those who get in contact with you and me, would they say, you've got something I need? You've got a joy that is real. They may not even put it in those words, but they may say, you just, I don't know, you just enjoy life. I heard about a woman who has been battling cancer Oh, boy, for well over a year now. And she was asked, how do you, I mean, I think it was a doctor said, how do you keep responding in such a pleasant way every time more bad news comes your way? And she announced to him, well, I can only do that by a grace that's given to me from God. But she went on to say, you know something? Doctors and nurses and physician assistants and medical personnel need Jesus Christ too. 
And where else will they see it unless Christians get cancer too? So that we can further the gospel. May I ask you something? Those who come in contact with us, do they see that joy of the gospel in you? You see a personal decision, a pointed direction, and I'll close. Those are your favorite words, aren't they, in the sermon? Doesn't really mean a lot to me, but I say I'll go ahead and say it. In closing, you see the premium delight. What does he say? Look at verse 21. For to me, here it is, to live. He was saying, I'm telling you, the ultimate delight of life, to live. Paul's not talking there about breathing in, breathing out. Another hour, another day. I've lived another day. Okay, I'm going through the motions of life. He's not talking about that kind of life. He's talking about living while living life. He's talking about having the ultimate joy of life for me to live. He goes, I have discovered the premium delight of all life is Christ. I mean, think about it. I mean, here's some teenage boy sitting in his room. He's got earbuds on playing uh, uh, song number 468 on his from his uh, iPod. He's got a remote control in his hand. He's, you know, he's, he's killing off who knows what they are from some foreign galaxy of another globe, you know, as he's playing some, some uh, video game on his monitor in his room. Another TV in another place of his room is flashing images of his favorite channel, the cartoon channel, and uh, he is his... Uh, his phone is somewhere on his desk, and it just it keeps buzzing and vibrating with, with texts and notifications that are coming his way. He's got all these little gadgets, and, and he doesn't, he's, got, he's got these headphones on, I should say, that's blocking out all kinds of other noises and so forth, and he's sitting there on the floor with a frown on his face. He doesn't hear someone pounding on the door. Finally, his mom comes barging in. She goes, what are you doing? He looks up, and he goes, oh, I'm just bored. <laughs> What? Got all these gadgets and toys and there. I'm just bored. I had nothing to do. Paul didn't have any of that kind of stuff. Who knows what he's eaten in this prison? Who knows what it smells like? We won't talk about the plumbing conditions. And he says, for me to live. I'm having the time of my life because it's all wrapped up in Christ. He's, had a, he's got a premium delight in his life. He says, I have found the real reason of living the purpose for breathing, the purpose for getting up on a day-to-day, on a day-to-day uh, reason to get up. It's all about Jesus Christ. In Psalm 16 and verse 11, the psalmist said this, at thy right hand, talking to, to the Lord God, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He wasn't just talking about I'm going to be really loving life when I finally get to be in there with you in heaven. He was saying, no, no, no. At thy right hand right now are pleasures forevermore. Jesus himself said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And yet, is that the description of your life? And I love this. Jesus one day spoke clearly his theology of true fellowship of him and a vast multitude that was following him said "Eh, i don't think we're going to follow him anymore and they turned and went away so jesus turned to his 12 students and he said will you also go away and i love peter peter comes up and he says to whom should we go you have the words of life you have everything that we want to live for and so when things fall apart When things unravel, when things aren't the way you want them to be politically, when things aren't the way you want them to be emotionally, when things are messed up physically, when people mistreat you, when life is filled with unanswered questions, what are you going to do? You're going to become cranky? Do you become irritable? Reclusive, vengeful, petty, sad, 
depressed, hard to live with. In the midst of all of my readings this last year, occasionally I just love to pick up some biography or some sort. <laughs> and some of you gray hairs will, will remember this name. I decided to just read a little bit about this guy that was known as, for years, the King of Cool, Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen was at one time, at the height of his successful movie world, was the most wealthy man in all of Hollywood. And yet he was the most miserable man. Nobody could get around him. Nobody could enjoy him because he was so self-focused. He was so selfish. He always wanted to make sure that in any billing that was put up about any movie that he was in, that his name would be in bigger letters and would be higher than anybody else's. And it wasn't until he got cancer that a preacher came to see him and said, are you prepared for eternity? And he said, I don't think I am. And that preacher introduced him to Jesus Christ. And so for the last year of Steve McQueen's life, he knew what it was to have peace and joy in his life when he accepted Christ as his Savior. I didn't know that until I read his biography. Miserable man until he came to Christ. What a shame that he didn't get to live long for Christ. We don't know that. We just know he lived for the flesh and for the world. And he was never at peace. And so, I sat in our upstairs part of our house. I called it my upper room. Times of pain. <laughs> Folks, I got to tell you, I cried at the silliest of things. I mean, a commercial would come on and they'd show some child, you know, stumble. And I go, oh man. I just start weeping over things all the time. I mean, I was just, I was a baby. There were times in which I couldn't, I, I couldn't walk at times. And I would just simply crawl over to the bed. And there was a lot of waiting and waiting and waiting and wondering. And the only way I was able to make it through those months was getting to know my Lord like never before and putting him as a central focus of my life as never before and coming to some sense of a conclusion like Paul. Well, for me to live... It's going to be Christ. And if I die, <laughs> it's gain. And when you come to that position that Christ is all you need and he's all you've got, we really get to know joy like never before. If you don't know Christ this morning, I urge you, I don't know how in the world you handle the happenings of life without Jesus. I don't know how you live. I don't know how you'd make it. I plead with you, come to know Christ today. For those of you who know Christ, make him the central focus. Refresh, renew, reawaken in your heart the centrality of him in your life. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Thank you for your patience. Father, please help us in the brief continuance of this service. Help us in these moments together to get locked in on the truth of the passage that we've looked at together today and understand what it is you're trying to tell us. Holy Spirit of God, bring people to the Savior that need the Savior today. And those who already have been adopted into the family of God, please give to them a sense of knowing that there needs to be a focus on you 
that is laser tight and that there's nothing to distract us from being locked in on pleasing you, walking with you, living for you. Refresh that in our hearts, we pray. Our heads are bowed. Hey, are you sitting here this morning and you know some things about church, you know some things about Christ, you know some things about the music we've sung, you know some things about all of these issues that, that come up at church, in the church world, but you know there's never been a time when you personally said, you know, I, I, I need Christ, Jesus Christ, in my life. And I realize that I, I don't have a relationship with God because I don't have Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is the bridge he is the one who connects us with God. He brings us into that relationship with God. You say, Morris, I don't know what you're talking about. When you realize that you're separated from God because of your sin, then you can come to God by way of Jesus and say, Jesus, please come into my life. You can pray right now, right there, right there where you sit. Would you do it? Pray right now, right there where you sit. Pray this prayer and mean it from your heart. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I deserve eternal death. I don't deserve to have a relationship with God. I know that. Jesus, you died for me. You were buried and you rose again for me. Jesus, save me right now. Come into my life right now. I'm not looking for some emotional feeling. I just take you at your word, Jesus, that you would save me. So save me right now. I need you. Did you just ask him to save you? You say, Morris, I did. And I'm in it. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm thrilled for you. I'm telling you, it's the most important decision you'll ever make because, hey, listen, when you have him, to die is gain because then there's no more pain. There's no more petty arguments. There's no more stressing out over issues of life. There's, there's no more bad news to deal with. To die is gain. And to live, to really live life is really living when you have Christ. Let me say to you, if you just prayed to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I'd love to know that. I'm not here to embarrass you. I hate to be embarrassed, and I hate to embarrass anybody. And so I'm not about to embarrass you. But if you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, would you let me know that by just simply lifting your hand up? I'll see it. You can put it down. Thanks, man. I'm glad you prayed that prayer. Wonderful. Hey, thanks. Wonderful. I'm so happy for you. Say, I just prayed that prayer. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else? See, I didn't embarrass these three. I won't embarrass you. Anyone else? Say, I prayed, and I meant it. If we can help you, we want to help you any way we can after the service to know this. God's people, can I just ask one more question? You've already accepted Christ as your Savior. How many of you would say, Morris, I heard something today from the Word of God I needed to hear. I heard something about having a joy. I heard something about the central focus of Christ. I heard something I needed to hear today, and God challenged my heart. If that's so, would you lift up your hand? God's people all over. Wonderful, wonderful. Would you stand with me? Let's all stand. You know me well enough. If you've been here in previous years, I'm not an arm-twisting kind of a guy. I'm not going to browbeat you and berate you and make you do something my way. There's a place you can come and pray if you'd like to come and pray. If you want to pray at your chair, do so. To those who said, I, I receive Christ as Savior, the pastor can tell you afterwards, but there's a, there's a gift that we want to give you after the service out in the hallway, out at the Welcome Center. We want you to come by there and let us know about that to help you. To God's people, I'm going to pray, and then the time for you to just seek the Lord any way you need to. Take the time with Him in these next few moments. Father, finish this service with your divine anointing and I pray that you'll do your hidden work in our hearts help us to magnify Christ in our lives we ask in your glorious name heads are bowed would you come and pray find that place to pray as the music continues God bless you
else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper in darkness trembles? Only a holy Jesus, we love you. We 